Hello everyone, my name is Lloyd. Um, this is my co-speaker Brenton. Today we're going to be discussing the applications of artificial intelligence and game-based learning, uh, specifically focusing on how we can create adaptive learning experiences. First, a little bit about us. Um, I'm the engineering team lead at the Live Lab, uh, at, which is at Texas A&M University, where I recently graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer science. I'm interested in game development for both entertainment purposes, but also for serious games and research purposes. Um, and I'm also really interested in how we can apply cutting edge research in computer science to both of these. I'm Brenton. I am also a member of the engineering team at the Live Lab at Texas A&M, where I'll be entering my junior year pursuing a bachelor's degree in computer science. I'm interested in both the fields of game development and artificial intelligence, as well as the cross section of how they can be used together. Here's a picture of our team. And so the Live Lab, uh, which is short for Learning Interactive Visualization Experience Lab, is a research lab at A&M. Um, we develop educational content aimed for higher education. Usually this means uh, creating educational games, which is either going to supplement or replace college level coursework in the form of a game-based course. And uh, most of the time we develop this content using Unity 3D or Unreal Engine. On the right side, you can see a couple of titles which we've developed in collaboration with the game company Trizium, uh, which is based in Bryan, Texas. An example of our work is Variant Limits. This is an educational game that teaches players the fundamentals of calculus. You play as a girl named Equa and attempt to unravel the game's narrative by solving calculus-based puzzles. Um, Variant is offered as part of a game-based course at A&M, uh, which replaces or gives credit for uh, introductory calculus classes. So, what exactly is game-based learning? Well, I'm sure several of you are already quite familiar with GBL, but I'll give a quick overview for those who aren't. Game-based learning is a teaching method which uses video games as a medium of knowledge transfer, educational practice, and knowledge assessment. The game serves as an explicitly defined learning context, and if designed properly, benefits from the intrinsic motivation which video games are well known for. Note that GBL is not the same as a gamification system. Gamification systems introduce game elements to non-game mediums and are typically based around scores, leaderboards, achievements, and other point systems or forms of, of competition amongst players. Typically, educational games follow traditional game development workflows. And as a result, they can't provide the same flexibility and custom tailored experience that a private tutor could give to a student. Even if the game is designed to react to the player's actions flexibly, that functionality must be identified and designed before the game ever reaches the player. Many game experiences are built for a specific experience with little to no deviance from it. See this map for a level from Uncharted Drake's Fortune as an example. The level has been meticulously crafted to provide a very specific, one-size-fits-all experience. Games like this are not intelligent. They won't be able to build a model of the player's current knowledge and emotions like a tutor or teacher might do uh, when they are assisting a struggling student. We believe that machine learning and AI can provide this functionality to educational games. So, how do we accomplish this? Before we discuss potential applications of machine learning and AI in GBL, I'd like to first justify its use in educational games. Using machine learning would allow games to classify and respond to players' current learning goals, current knowledge, and current emotional state, each of which has an impact on both the learning and gameplay experience. The player's current progress towards achieving learning outcomes, as well as their strengths and weaknesses, could be identified and the game could respond to best assist the player. This would create a personalized experience that is unique to each player, much like a private tutor or a one-on-one -on -one session with a teacher. Such a system is called an intelligent tutoring system, and although quite a bit of research already exists on, for ITSs, only a portion of it is specifically targeted towards games. Additionally, machine learning allows the game to classify learners based on their level of competence. This will allow the game to change the granularity of the information which is being presented to the player and the complexity of the game mechanics to be more detailed and complex for highly competent players and to be less detailed and simpler for less competent players. This is very similar to adaptive hypermedia, 
a technology which builds a model of the goals, preferences, and knowledge of the user, and then changes the presentation of some hypermedia based on that model. For example, what if Variant Limits built a model of the user's knowledge and mastery level, and then used that information to present more difficult or less difficult problems to them? Perhaps some patterns of limits or derivatives would not appear to the player until they had reached some minimum level of competency. Moving on, even though we found some use cases for AI and GBL, there are some other very important factors to consider. The first being that games are real-time applications. Any, any task involving classification models or training data, which will occur at runtime, must not cause increased latency. Additionally, a misclassification from the trained model should not reduce the quality of the learner's experience, nor should it reduce the quality of the education they receive from the game. This implies that the player, or perhaps their instructor, should always have the ability to override any adaptive game systems. And of course, to appeal to the largest audience of homes and classrooms possible, excess barriers to entry should be eliminated. This means that specialized hardware or other sensors which are costly are undesirable for our purposes. To successfully create either an intelligent tutoring system or an adaptive game experience, we will need to model the player's current knowledge, emotions, actions, or other relevant data to be able to determine their learning goal at any point in time. Game-based learning literature shows that there are quite a few options for doing this with decent success, including dynamic Bayesian networks, rule learning, and support vector machines. Any of these approaches will require a proper set of training data. This should include learners with various levels of subject matter competence, various strengths and weaknesses, such as strong in English or weak in math, and lastly, players with various preferred learning styles. This last type of data is important because it could affect minute-by-minute -minute learning goals due to the differences in approach, but also because it could be used to decide what type of assistance to provide to the player. For example, someone who's a visual learner might be okay with watching a small video demo of something, but someone who's a kinesthetic learner might need a, a guided tutorial sequence. So now we can talk about um, how exactly can we apply machine learning to game-based learning. So uh, our first example is going to be Lester et al.'s Crystal Island. Um, this is a game that uses a dynamic Bayesian network to model the changes of the game's narrative state, world state, and player state over time. Uh, this DBN is also used to determine what actions the intelligent agent known as the director agent should take to assist the player when necessary, um, and to also to predict the effects of such actions, which includes how the player might respond to the director's assistance. The director agent's main goal is to plan and move forward the narrative of the game, um, and also to maximize what the authors refer to as narrative tutorial utility. Um, this is a heuristic. It serves to define which help actions are going to be more beneficial to the player and to the game story than other help actions. Additionally, the game is trained on wizard data, which is just gameplay data from uh, trained professionals who play through the game or assisted players with their playthroughs. I've provided a simplified version of the director agent's DBN for clarity here on the right side. Um, if you want to see the full diagram, then check out figure 4 on the original paper from Lester et al. So again, uh, the DBN is used to model the game's narrative state, world state, and player state over time. Uh, so you could summarize all this and say the model is accounting for current story progress, the state of the 3D game world, and the user's current expected goals, their current knowledge, and their current emotions. Uh, specifically, frustration and boredom are what's being targeted here. So for a narrative state T, the director uses the DBN to decide the most probable resultant state of some arbitrary action, uh, which results in a narrative state T plus 1. The director then uses T plus 1 to guess the most probable resultant state of the player's expected response in T plus 1, which results in a narrative state T plus 2. So the narrative tutorial utility of T plus 2 is calculated, and the highest calculated utility state of all possible T plus 2 states 
Uh, that's how the director is going to decide what action to take at any point in time. This DBN approach to intelligent tutoring systems is significant because it's modeling player knowledge, emotions, and goals over time, um, while also proposing a goal recognition framework. As explained in the original paper, uh, this particular implementation of ITS did show uh, significant learning gains on students who played the game versus students who did not play the game. Um, some of the downsides of this approach is that this approach requires domain experts to train the game on, um, the wizards. Additionally, it's unclear how the director's help actions were defined. Uh, and it's also unclear if the goal recognition framework in Crystal Island had a reliable and high level of accuracy. Another more recent um, ITS approach is by Ramirez et al. And they used rule learning to classify players by their current learning goal or their, their current expected learning goal um, in an open world game. And so every action that the player takes in the game is recorded and placed into a sequence of actions. This rule learning approach is pretty significant because it's entirely non-domain specific. Um, player classification can be performed solely based on their actions rather than their current knowledge. Also, the hint system in this uh, game is completely non-intrusive. You only get a hint if you ask for it. You have to click on the, the hint button. So this means that the player will always work at their own pace. And another benefit to the system is that since it's so straightforward, it's just recording player actions, uh, it could be easily set up with some network features to collect analytics of player actions over time, which can gradually improve its own training set automatically. This kind of makes me think of the uh, message and help system in Dark Souls where players from across the network can leave messages for other players to read as, as hints on how to move forward. So on the downside, this approach is showing that uh, latency is an issue. Um, the game would lag every time someone clicks on the hint button uh, because it's doing computation using these player models. Another downside is that since this approach isn't domain specific, the hints given to the player are also not domain specific. They're just proposing an action to perform. And so maybe this type of hint isn't as useful for helping the players achieve learning outcomes. The last paper that we're going to talk about today is from McQuiggan et al, where they implemented several early prediction models for detecting learner frustration. Um, and so this is going to be the emotional detection models. Uh, for learners. Identifying learners' emotional states could be really useful uh, when determining when game systems should provide assistance to the player, and also what kind of assistance to provide to the player, which can be seen in Crystal Island. And as a matter of fact, this research is related to Crystal Island and was used for uh, part of the player state model in that game. We're not going to be going into detail on their implementations, um, but we will just be discussing the significance of this paper. Some of the models that they used in the paper were uh, a sequential model based on n-grams, uh, like the same ones used in natural language processing, and then some non-sequential models where naive Bayes uh, decision trees and support vector machines. This paper demonstrated that there's a lot of different ways that you can skin the cat that is ITS um, in, in terms of both selected features and also chosen model. Um, the, they made it very clear that any type of player model that's going to be used for ITS purposes is going to require a game environment which allows the observation of learner behavior, um, the observation of learner's performance, and the identification of learners' current goals, learning goals. Some areas for improvement in this research would be to remove physical sensors that they use in the studies, uh, which were used to measure things like student heart rate, I believe, and to try the study for more emotions other than just anxiety, frustration, or boredom. Um, it might be beneficial to also know when a student is feeling uh, good emotions instead of just bad emotions. Um, maybe that could be used not just to provide players assistance, but also some kind of feedback or gratification mechanism within the game. 
In conclusion, machine learning and AI are pretty well suited for game-based learning. They could be used to create personalized learning experiences, um, which could then adapt to learners' levels of competence, uh, while also modifying game content, such as mechanics and displayed information, based on the current player model in a manner similar to adaptive hypermedia. At the same time, games could also provide personalized intelligent tutoring in the form of ITSs. Existing literature describing ITSs in game-based learning has shown measurable learning games over non-ITS versions of the same games. However, there are still many challenges ahead. Learning goal recognition and emotion detection still need more research to become reliably and highly accurate. Runtime computation using player models needs to be done so in a lag-free manner, and hint and tutorial actions need to be defined in such a way that they have a clear and measurable learning value. Existing ITS research should be re-examined without sensors and other physical devices that might create a high barrier to entry to the use of AI in game-based learning. These four papers provided a majority of the information which we covered today. If you're interested in any of the gritty details behind today's topics, please read the original papers. Thank you for watching our presentation. We'll now move on to the Q&A session.